right, good morning, Lakeside. Are you ready to praise this morning? We need to stand. Let's go ahead and stand, everyone.
Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. Everyone. I have a future. And God has a plan for me. Everyone, of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure. All right, Jesus, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Lakeside. Let's go and echo once again now. Your word is faithful. It's mighty with power. And God will deliver me. Everyone together now. Of this I'm sure. Of this I'm sure. That's right. Jesus. Jesus. You're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. You're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. All right, Lakeside, let's take some time out here to greet one another that are worshiping with us this Sunday.
my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Good. Listen that one more time now, everyone. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your hope. I put my hope. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Come on, give a shout out, Lakeside. Let me hear you. Amen. All right, let's all be seated, please. Good morning. I'm doing okay. <laughs> well, tell us about it, Jim. <laughs> no, I talk too much as it is. Uh, stop it. You know I do. Me and Kat are in a contest. <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> How do I get serious? <laughs> That's a tough one. You can do it, though, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> I want to read Colossians 3, 12, and 13 this morning. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, yes. kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, I just also want to thank you that it seems the weather is cooling down, and that's awesome. And maybe some rain is on its way somewhere. I'm not sure from where, but you do. So I just, we just pray, Lord, that we know you're in charge. So, Lord, we, just, uh, we do ask for rain. We do ask, Father, for uh, the crops and all of that to just um, whatever it needs, you will supply. Lord, we just want to give you praise and glory this morning. Father, you are awesome above all. You are God. You are King. Uh, Lord, you're everything. So many times on Facebook, uh, they always leave a blank. They say, what does Jesus mean to you? Oh, my goodness. Uh, salvation. <laughs> my sins are forgiven. Uh, there's just a list that could go on and on. And, Lord, we just thank you for that so much. It, it is awesome. Lord, um, we don't deserve that. But, Lord, you came when we were undeserving and died for us. Lord, we just give you praise and glory. I'd like to pray this morning for some of the sick, for Kathy Hernandez, Lord. I know we've been praying and praying, and we're not going to stop. Uh, she needs the prayers, Lord, and I just ask that you bless her. I'm not sure where that's at right now, but Lord, I just pray that you would be with Kathy, that she would feel your presence. And Lord, I have to imagine, as long as this has been going on, Kathy must be getting strength from you. Father, so thank you, and we ask that that continues. Lord, I just pray for Des this morning and all that is with that, and I just pray that you'll bless her and be with her in her health. Thank you, Father. I pray, Lord, for Jane Groves, who isn't here today. I know uh, they're, they're somewhere, but uh, that was sort of stupid. But anyway, uh, bless them, Lord. For Sharon Dibble, Lord, I just pray that... Um, that you'd bless her. I hope she's listening. And Lord, we love her. And uh, just just pray for her, Lord. We'd love to see her back. But I understand if she can't come, that Lord, we just continue to pray for her and continue to love her, Father. I just pray for the very young Joe Hernandez. Um, that would be the one with Jesse. Uh, because whenever we see Jesse, that's the one we run to. So I just pray that you'll be with Joe, Father. Uh, bless him. I, I just thank you, Lord, for the miracle of Mary's leg. Oh, my goodness, she was standing without any uh, lift on one of her feet, Lord, and, and I know you saw that, uh, Father, and uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for that, and I just pray that she continues to get better every day, and you'll just bless her, uh, Father. Lord, uh, also, I want to pray for Duane this morning, Lord, that you bless him, that you be with him, continue to... Help him, Father. We love him. Lord, we love all of you. And we just want to thank you, uh, Lord, for what you're doing in Duane's life. And Lord, um, I don't ever want to forget uh, to pray for our pastor and his family. 
Lord, um, I know uh, if you asked him, he would probably s say yes, pray for me. So, Lord, we want to pray for him and his family this morning because I know this isn't an easy job. Although we are all saints and perfect people, um, <laughs> uh, Lord, I just, I just pray that you'll bless Stan and his family. Thank you. Thank you so much for him. And, Lord, I know there are guests here today uh, that probably have never been here before, possibly. And I just pray, Lord, that they will be able to see you through all the things we say and do this morning. So bless this service. Bless this time together. Uh, Lord, as we are here in this hospital of God, we just want to thank you and praise you in thy name. Amen. For Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy Through every trial my soul will sing No turning back, I've been set free Christ is enough for me and Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ, my all in all, the joy of my salvation. Oh, yes, he is. And this hope will never fail, for heaven is our home. Through every storm, my soul will sing, Jesus is here, to God be the glory, for Christ is enough for me. Yes, Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back the cross before me the world behind me no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning That's right. Would you stand with us, everyone? For Christ. Everything I need is in you. Every Let's sing that again, Lakeside. Christ is. Christ is enough for me. Yes, Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Every Lord, I have decided.
follow Jesus. I want to hear you, everyone. Give a shout out now. Come on. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Would you please be seated? I'm going to read Call to Confession. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. We express our longing for God's leading by our own transparent confession. Prayer of Confession. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out all my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sins is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me, assurance of pardon. While I keep silence, my body wastes away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, Lord, and I did not hide my iniquities. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Amen. Well, it is so good to have you here, everyone. Those who are present in the sanctuary, those who are with us on live stream, it is good to be together in this way. We've been praying for uh, many, one being Sharon Dibble. And Sharon, I know, I know you are watching. We had the wonderful... Um, privilege of uh, meeting with Sharon this past week, Pam and I, and uh, we just miss her dearly just as you all miss her dearly. And she looks forward to being here, and Lord willing, maybe, just maybe, it'll be soon. So we really hope that. So Sharon, game on, Sharon, game on. Um, and so uh, as I look out here, uh, so, you know, Joseph uh, Hernandez, you, you keep praying over you. Just glad that your health is, is doing well here. Um, and uh, I look out here and um, um, I see Pastor Jim Hansen and his wife here. So good to have you with us. And if you're if you're thinking right now, this very moment, did you say Jim Hansen, uh, Tim? Yes, we share the same name. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think we're uh, related <laughs> as far as I know. But, you know, the funny thing is, as, as Pam and I moved into the area, uh, what, uh, 30 some odd years ago, that um, uh, that was the first thing we were asked. Hey, are you related to that Jim Hansen guy who uh, preaches uh, out here? Uh, and so uh, um, Jim is going to be, uh, I'm sure Stan will make mention of this, but uh, Jim will be filling the pulpit uh, next Sunday. And so appreciate your doing that, uh, Jim. And so uh, also, uh, Marie, good to have you back here, Miss Marie. <laughs> and so Marie, many things that Marie does so well. Now, one of them, she, she uh, helps to, to coordinate uh, weddings, and she did that for just a, a dear friend, one who is, um, is working at the King's Christian um, Thrift Store. Uh, she got married this last weekend, so Marie helped out with the planning of that. Now, I make mention of that because, uh, I w first of all, we missed her. Uh, and I know that she did just an incredible job. Uh, secondly, so uh, I got to see some, some video of like the reception of that, the post wedding. <laughs> and I, I, well, okay, that she's giving it away. So, so I, don't, I don't know who had more fun, you know, the bride and the groom and so on. 
or Marie, you know, just as she's all over the place. Like, so, so she was just loving it. So we're glad to have you back there, Marie. <laughs> all right, we need to talk about uh, what's happening the Lakeside uh, Ministry. And so uh, today, later on today, our youth will be gathering. It will be here at 5 o'clock. And thank you to the Marshall family who's going to be hosting and leading that time. And so a lot of great things happening here with devotions and some food, some volleyball, all sorts of things. And even the, some of the kids will participate as well. And so, and so uh, that takes place here at 5 o'clock uh, for our youth. And uh, not only that, but then, uh, as I had mentioned in, in previous Sundays, our youth will be getting together again on the first Friday of October. And that will be at the Dobbins's place, so Chase and Shana Dobbins, at 5 o'clock at their place. So that will be that first Friday. I think it's the 6th of October. Uh, they will be gathering again. So awesome things happening for our youth group. So looking further in this particular week, everyone, our Wednesday evening Bible study that Roger Reynolds leads, that will happen on Wednesday at 6.30 over here in our social hall. And then, of course, on Saturday, if it's a Saturday, then, of course, it's breakfast time. So whoever decides to show up, uh, Breakfast Club will be meeting. And this time it will be at Chubby's, uh, Chubby's in Hanford. All right. And then I do need to make mention that uh, it was just confirmed. Uh, you do understand that it's almost October, everyone. So uh, on the latter part of October uh, 28th, I believe, that's Saturday, uh, we will be having a um, our Harvest Fest. We like to call it annual because we normally have that. And so uh, that will be on that Saturday 28th. Uh, no particular time set yet, but at least you can nail that date down. And, of course, we normally like to have uh, those who like to dress up, and we have our trunk or treat and a whole bunch of fun things. And so uh, mark that date down, that Saturday, the 28th of October. Okay, and then last of all, I need to make mention of some uh, birthdays coming up, some anniversaries. So uh, Ron has a birthday coming up later this week. Uh, Joe, Joe, this is Joe Hernandez, uh, who gave our prayer confession and assurance moments ago. Happy birthday coming up to you there, brother. And then uh, the Black family, they have a, um, a granddaughter here, has a birthday, Callie, so happy birthday to her. And some anniversaries now. First, I need to make mention of the Marshall family again. They have an anniversary coming up later this week. So, Curtis, I'm putting you on the spot here, brother. How many years are we talking? Mm. All right. Okay, make sure I heard that 23. Okay, so that those on live stream, he said 23, and he said it with a smile on his face there, those on live stream. And so let the record show there, Donna. All right, and uh, happy anniversary to my bride. We, uh, how many years here, honey? I put her on the spot. 35, 35. Hey, you know why she knows that? You know why she knows that? Because in our house, right in our living room area, is a big blown up uh, uh, balloons of three and five right there. <laughs> and so it's an easy reminder as to uh, how, how many years for us. You know, I also want to make mention before I end here, everyone, if, if any of you would like a, an update in the church directory, again, uh, Terry McGann does such an incredible job of trying to keep that up to date. Um, that uh, if there's anything that needs to be changed or added, you see these things up in the foyer, in the, the table in the foyer area, please go ahead and grab it and then fill that out. We'd like to make sure and get things right just so we have uh, just everything right in our eyes as to names and addresses and numbers and so on. One last thing here. You, you heard Jim earlier in his prayer talk about clothing ourselves, right? clothing ourselves. We, uh, the Bible says, and this was the Apostle Paul who had encouraged the people of um, um, the Colossians to, to clothe themselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility. And, and, and that happens to be uh, today's reading from the Daily Bread. And if you do not have a devotional tool, this is wonderful. It's wonderfully um, uh, informational. It just gets you into the word. It's a great motivation just to get into the word and to live out the word in your lives. And so I highly recommend this. Um, this the new one has just come out just for September. And so they, they are back there in the foyer area as well if you don't have them. One of the wonderful things I like about that particular piece of scripture is, and, and I learned this long ago back when I first um, became a believer, 
is that, uh, yes, yes, Levi, David, I agree, too. He's saying hallelujah there. So um, that uh, this reminder, you know, put on, put on, clothe yourselves with these things. And so whenever I, I just put on my morning clothes, it's like a reminder. Okay, I'm putting this on. God, I want to clothe myself with compassion. I want to clothe myself with humility and kindness. That's just a, a, a physical and visible way just to remind me of just my game plan, of what God desires from me. All right, I'm going to ask for our kids uh, to be dismissed for Children's Church. Have a good time, kids. All right, Joe and Amy, are you leading today? All right, thanks for doing that. I appreciate that. And Colton, you too. Thanks, brother. Thanks for helping out. Welcome again to 3.30, the television show where we give local builders 30 days and $3,000 to showcase their talents. Today is a very special day because today we're at my house and we have a local builder in my backyard that's going to build my children a fort. They have 30 days and $3,000 to dream up any fort that they can imagine. <laughs> But let's not get ahead of ourselves because today is just the day that they will just be laying the foundation. Hey, let's go check out and see what's going on, shall we? I am so excited to see what's going on in my backyard today. Again, today is just the foundation, but it'll give you an idea of how great and how big this project really can be. Hey, it's done. <laughs> it's done. We are here with Dan the Builder. Uh, Handy Dan Dodson. Dan the Builder. Uh, Handy, Handy Dan. Handy Dan. Dan, you, even though you had $3,000 in 30 days to build the fort, you actually built the fort in one day. Uh, well, and, and listen, like I was telling you, I, I misunderstood. I, I thought the 330 stood for uh, three hours and $30, you know, but under those circumstances, I think I built a pretty good uh, fort here, you know, and, and actually had enough left over that I got me some Taco Bell and a Gatorade. <laughs> good for you, Dan. And I see with the time that you had, you went ahead and you built a little fence here, huh? Well, yeah, I thought you might have some ponies or something. Ponies? No, Dan, we don't have any ponies. <laughs> no, no. Okay, oh, great. I could, I could fix that. I uh, was thinking about putting a gate there anyway. But hey, how about this fort, right? I mean, with the time allotted and the money, I think I had a, I had a, uh, I did a pretty good job for your kiddos. I think they're going to enjoy it. I actually built them a little reading nook right here, you know, in case they want to read their Henry Potter books and whatnot. Well, I can fix that. All righty, Dan. Handy, Dan. Uh-huh. It seems like you got the slide, but you've added something to it. Yeah, I, I created these. I call them slide stoppers. You slide stoppers. Yeah, yeah, well, if you have a hefty kid or two that stops them from, you know. Hitting the fence you made right there. Yeah, you don't want to break a pinky or something. That is very medieval, Dan. Well, that's just general physics. <laughs> All right, that's good. Well, it seems sturdy enough. Okay, all right. I can, I can fix that. Okay, that's be great. Well, here's something positive. You have built a climbing rock wall. Yeah, yeah. And those are real rocks there, Dan? Nothing but the best, Clark. It's Carl. All right, I'm just gonna climb on up here and test it out up there, all right? Yep. Permission to board, El Capitan. Here we go. I can fix that. Well, this is a first on 330. Dan the Handy Builder. Handy Dan. Handy Dan is basically. I, I can fix that. Dan, please, just come down. This is sand. Dan, can you explain this to me? Yeah, that's your foundation, boss man. The foundation is made out of sand. Well, technically, it's a floating slab on Sandy Lomas. That's why it sways, Dan! No, not that sort can withstand an earthquake! 
This thing couldn't withstand an earthquake. This thing couldn't withstand a light rain. It couldn't even withhold my fourth grade son. Well, he is kind of husky. You built the fort on sand, Dan. The foundation is everything. Don't keep pushing that. You're gonna break it. Ah! I can fix that. Okay. That's a great video and perfect for where we're going this morning. So uh, welcome everybody and welcome to all those who are on live stream. Um, yeah, I just want to, um, so what I typically try to do once a year, I try to do a, 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 a Mount Sinai experience you know, where Moses goes to spend time with the Lord. And I'm going to do that this week. Uh, just spend some time in prayer and preparation for Advent and among other things. So I'm very thankful that Pastor Jim is going to be preaching next Sunday. Um, and Esther, thanks for being here. And Donnie, good friend Donnie's here with us too. So Jim, he's retired. And so now that he's retired, he's more flexible I always thought, man, it would be really cool if Pastor Jim can come and preach. So thank you. And what's cool, too, he's going to continue our series in Luke. So he'll be taking the next segment in uh, Luke 7, verses 1 through 10. But I'm very grateful for that. And I'm going to be watching. Make sure you guys are here. <laughs> so he has someone to preach to. All right. Uh, man, it's so good to be here. God is so good. Now, this message, I was thinking about it, that this is such a powerful message. You know, they're all powerful. This is the end of Jesus' preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And I thought about this, that, you know, if I were, let's just say I, I was retiring and I had one Sunday to preach a message, this may be one of those messages that I would end with. That's how powerful uh, this, this teaching is. And so let's take a look. Let's look at Luke 6, verses 46 and 49. Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He's like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your church. Thank you for this house of worship. Lord, it's already been it's a wonderful service. And we thank you, Lord, for all those who are here and for those who are on live stream. And those who may be traveling, we pray that you would keep them safe. And Lord, as, as I am praying, um, I just feel the need, and we've already prayed, but I, I just feel like I need to add that prayer for Kathy Hernandez. I'm assuming, Lord, that... Um, Kathy's watching. 
You know, this verse that comes to mind is, my ways are not your ways, nor my thoughts like yours. Father, you have determined that it be your will that Kathy has struggled for two years. And it's hard, Lord. We can only imagine, Father God, that you have a tremendous reward for her. Because she's hanging in there, although I know, I'm sure there are times she just wants to quit, give up. But God, you sustain her. And you sustain Joe. And we just pray, Lord, oh my goodness, Father, please, please, let her have a good appointment this week to where they will say she's okay to have surgery. But God, we just pray for her, Lord, please just give her the strength that she needs to overcome the pain and uncomfortableness she experiences. And um, we just lift up our sister to you now in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to get a little um, doctrinal here as far as my intro is concerned. And um, in order to help kind of set up this message. So, you know, there's a false teaching in some evangelical churches today that you can accept Jesus as your Savior, but that obeying Him as Lord of your life is optional. There are those who think that they are preserving the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith apart from human works. Now, they do not deny the importance of submitting to Christ as Lord, but they believe it has nothing to do with saving faith. So they teach that it's possible for a person to truly believe in Jesus as Savior, even though they never submit to Him as Lord. I believe this teaching of saving grace gives false assurance to many people. There are many who think that they are Christians, but they're really not truly saved. Scripture is very clear that without holiness, without holiness, no one will see God. In Hebrews 12, 14, it says that. It says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and be Holy, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, genuine saving faith always results in a life pursuing holiness. Now, it's not perfection. Holiness is a process. If a person claims to be saved, but has no real hunger for God's Word, or, or they don't really hate their sin, and they have no desire for godly living, they need to examine whether they are truly saved. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? See, Jesus is coming to the end of his sermon on the Beatitudes, like I mentioned earlier. He's been teaching some really difficult things. And he drives home the necessity of obeying what he has taught. 
And he asked pointedly, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say? He then concludes with this familiar parable of two men building separate houses. The first lays a foundation on the rock, stands firm when the floods come against it. The second foolishly builds his house without proper foundation and the flood destroys it. See, this parable, the foundation is obedience to Christ's teaching. And the man who did not build on the foundation, he heard Jesus' teaching. He agreed with it superficially by first calling Jesus Lord. But he did not obey Jesus' teaching, resulting in tragic loss. Thus, Jesus is showing that obedience to Christ is not optional. Because it is at the very foundation of the Christian life. Now some will say, wait one cotton pick in minute. Now I didn't swear just then. I thought that faith, not obedience, is the foundation of the Christian life. After all, according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we are saved by grace through faith from works. Also, according to John 3, 16, the one who believes in Jesus has eternal life. So how can you say that obedience is the foundation? Well, the answer centers on the nature of saving grace. See, saving faith inevitably and necessarily results in a life of holiness and good works. And many who quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 fail to go on to quote verse 10, which says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. And then there's those who quote John 3.16, but fail to look at John 3.36, which states, He who believes the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, one of the things I mentioned in last week's message was that the nature of a tree determines the type of fruit. If a person has received a new nature through faith in Christ, that new nature will bear good fruit. And we are saved by grace through faith apart from works, but that faith saves only results in good works. And also, we need to understand that Jesus was not teaching his followers how to live a sinless and perfect life. It was, if that was a requirement for getting into heaven, no one's going to get there. Not even the most devout Christian who loves God all the time, with every fiber of their being, what Jesus is teaching is being what James later highlighted in his book, that faith without works is dead. So James 2.17 and James 2.26 says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So genuine faith is not simply intellectual agreement it's genuine faith that submits to the lordship of Jesus, resulting in a life of gradual holiness. Now, in this passage, Jesus is showing us three reasons why obedience to him is not optional. And I know I kind of started off with some doctrinal stuff. 
Now I'm getting into more applicable stuff. Okay? So in our, in our, in our bulletin, you'll see um, the outline there. The first thing is this. Obedience is not optional because it is the true test. It's the true test of professing Christ. Let me read verse 46 again. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? See, if we call him our Lord, we prove it by doing what he tells us to do in his word. Notice how Jesus undeniably asserts his rightful position as Lord because he does not say, don't call me Lord, only God is Lord. Rather, he assumes that he has the rightful authority to be Lord. And his lordship governs all of life down to our every thought. See, obedience to Jesus as Lord is not just an option for some who want to be more committed. It's part of being a legit Christian. And those who do not submit to his teaching or lordship, one would have to wonder if they're even a Christian at all. In fact, there's a real danger of a false profession of allegiance to Christ. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Wow. Basically what Jesus is saying here is that we can talk a good game. But can we really play? See, athletes can can talk a great game, but that tells you nothing about their athletic skill. I remember one one time on our softball team, before the season, some guy comes up, hey, man, you guys need some players? Man, I'm really good, I'm really good, and I've been playing a long time, and well, cool, join us, man. And we're like, what's this guy doing on our team? That's terrible. But we let him play anyway because it wasn't about winning. It was about fellowship and all that stuff. But (laughs) (laughs) he talked a good game, but he didn't deliver. And see, not everyone who talks about heaven belongs to God's kingdom. Jesus is more concerned about our walk than our talk. He wants us to do right, not just say the right words. And what you do cannot be separated from what you believe. When Jesus says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? He's giving a strong warning here. It's the warning of deception. Because it's easy to get faked out by people who claim to be Christian. To the men Jesus addressed were shocked when he said to them, I never knew you, and commands them to depart from his presence. And also Jesus was warning those who call him Lord, not to those who didn't. And if you ask these folks Jesus is referring to, are you a Christian, a follower of Jesus? They would have responded, oh yes, amen, Jesus is Lord. But they were sadly deceived. Not only did they call Jesus Lord, they called him Lord with feeling and passion. When they, used the, the, when they used Lord twice, it meant they were emphatic about it. See, they just didn't say Lord once. They said, Lord, Lord. 
They didn't lower their voices and mumble when they said it. They strongly asserted that Jesus was their Lord, and yet, as Jesus' parable goes on to show, they were heading for major destruction because their profession was superficial and false. Thus, Jesus' warning is addressed to most of us, too. Most of us here today would say, yes, I'm a Christian. Jesus is my Savior. But Jesus is saying, examine your heart. Do you really seek to obey me? Is your heart and thoughts really about me? Do you judge your sin in the light of my word? Or could you be fooling yourself? Are you excusing your disobedience by claiming to be under grace? Are you justifying yourself by thinking, well, everyone does it. Obedience to Jesus is not optional just for the super committed. It's a sure, true test of whether your faith in Christ is genuine or fake. And just like you need me, you need my faith to be genuine. Because you trust me to bring God's word. You trust me to lead the church. I need you. I need your faith to be genuine. And so does your family. So does your workplace or your school or wherever you are. It needs to be genuine. Because, man, we're living in a world of of fakeness and evil, and people are looking for the real thing. And Jesus goes on to show this parable of the two house builders. And the parable of the two different foundations show why obedience is not optional. The first gives a positive example, followed by a negative example. And then his sermon ends abruptly with a negative example, leaving leaving us with a thought about the tragic scene of a house that is destroyed by a flood. Well, the second thing here is this. Obedience is not optional because it is the foundation that will withstand the test of time and eternity. See, this is, a, this is a house that was built on the rock. The first home builder represents a man who not only hears, but he acts on Jesus' words. See, he works hard at digging into the soil until it hits bedrock, and then he anchors his foundation on it. And he does this to make sure his house rests on a solid foundation. And when the storms come and the flash floods burst against his house, it stands firm. See, his house represents our lives because we're all building a house. The question is, Are we building our lives on the sure foundation of obedience to Jesus? Or are we building on the sand of empty profession? See, to build a house involves a lot of time and money. It's not like you're building a shed. In a new home, you can install the finest hardwood cabinets. You can spend extra money on brass doorknobs or crystal chandeliers or a a custom fireplace. But if the house is not resting on a solid foundation, you are throwing your money away. And if you build a house of your life without obedience to Jesus from your heart, it's like wasting your money on a house without a foundation. And when you build your house 
no matter where it is, you can be sure the storms of life will test its foundation. You know, the climate in Jesus' day is much like Arizona, subject to sudden flash floods. See, dry stream beds can turn into raging torrents and sweep away whatever is in its path. And if you live near, live near a dry bed, or stream bed, you better make sure you have a solid foundation. I I remember uh, when we went on vacation years ago, we went to Zion, and we were kind of walking through the narrows a little bit, and someone had said that, hey, if you see off in the distance dark clouds, get out of there. Because if a storm is happening over there, water can come flying through there without you even knowing it. Got to be careful. Now, the flood refers both to the trials of this life and the future judgment when, we, judgment when we stand before God. And the person who has built his life on obedience to Jesus has a solid foundation. They will carry him or her through the floods of this life and future judgment. And the person who professes to know Jesus but is not walking in obedience, will be wiped out when the trials of life come and ultimately ruin the later when they stand before God. See, there are only two final results. The one house stands, the other house falls. There is no middle possibility of sustaining just a little damage. The point, this points to the fact that there are only two final destinations. There's heaven, and then there's hell. There's not a middle ground like, oh, it's kind of cool here. Uh, it kind of sucks here. But hey, I guess I'll adapt. No. Now, before the flood, the houses looked pretty much the same to a casual observer. But there was a huge difference between the two when the floods hit. One storm, one stood firm, the other destroyed. The difference was the hidden part, the foundation. And foundations aren't very glamorous, are they? But they are absolutely essential for the long haul. Now, what are some of these inevitable floods that will test your faith? They are the trials that we all face in life. They are the disappointments, the setbacks, the sickness, loss of loved ones, loss of a job, being let down by family members or friends and so on. Those are the floods that come. And then there are the floods of trials that come along with getting older. The loss of health and strength and not being able to do the things you used to do. And then there's that constant reality of dealing with your own inevitable death. All these trials test whether we are true disciples of Jesus or just fair weather followers who are not sincere in faith. And we also need to remember the floods of temptation. And these floods come at us from the world, they come at us from the flesh, they come at us from the devil. And this evil world is under the dominion of Satan presses on us relentlessly, often in subtle ways that we're not even aware of. We're tempted to cheat or to steal or engage in immorality or the pleasure of riches. And all these things are meant to destroy you 
and all who are important to us. The point is, if you're not establishing the habit of obedience in Jesus every day, if you're not taking every thought captive to him, confessing, forsaking all known sin, you're building your life on sand, and when these inevitable temptations come, they will sweep you away and your profession of faith that you have made. Then ultimately, the final trial we all must face is to die and stand before God. And he knows everything about us. He knows if we have been hypocrites, putting on a good front before others, claiming to be Christian, but all the while living in disobedience, it will all come crashing down one day. And the Bible is very clear that everyone will be called to account before God's throne. And those who may fool everyone else on earth cannot fool God. And only those who have fought the good fight, lived a life of obedience in God's word, constantly examining themselves by his word, judging their sin, seeking to be pleasing to God, will stand. And those who have said, Lord, Lord, but have no desire to obey him, will be ruined. And that leads to the final reason Jesus gives that obedience is not optional. That obedience is not optional because those who do not obey Christ face sudden and final destruction. Let me read verse 49 again. It says, But the one who hears my word and does not put it into practice is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. See, with this guy building his house without a foundation, you have to ask, why would he do such a dumb thing? Well, there could be several reasons. One, see, it was a lot of work, and it took a lot of time to dig by hand down to the bedrock, and the foolish man was lazy. See, it's much easier just to throw up the house without a hard heart of laying a solid foundation. And so he followed the path of least resistance. You know, have you ever done a, a home improvement project on a house that someone owned before you? You come across a situation where, where the previous owner fixed the problem by doing it the easy way, but it wasn't done right. In the long run, it would have been better just to do it right in the first place. And because now you have to tear it apart, his botched up easy fix in order to really fix the problem. You see, there's a spiritual parallel here. Disobedience is usually much easier than obedience. And it seems at the time it's going to get you where you want to go more quickly than more difficult path of obedience. See, the guy who threw up his house without a foundation, you know, he's inside relaxing. He's having a beer. His neighbor, though, He's out in the hot sun, dripping with sweat as he digs his foundation. It's kind of like, like, like a young man seeing another guy living with his beautiful girlfriend, enjoying all the pleasures of the flesh with seemingly no consequences. Meanwhile, you're in the trenches battling for moral purity and obedience in Jesus. So you wonder to yourself, why am I digging this foundation while that guy sits in his comfortable house with his girlfriend on his lap? 
but wait until the flood hits and you'll know the reason. The second thing is that the man who, with no proper foundation just wanted the benefits of the house. He just wanted a roof over his head. Nice furniture, not, not, nicely, neatly arranged. And spiritually, a lot of people come to Jesus for the benefits he offered. Seemingly, they are, they are instantly enjoying the blessings of salvation, even though they never repented of sin. Not daily judging their sin by his word. They enjoy the good feelings of singing the praise songs, clapping their hands. They, they like the love and the fellowship of the body, but privately, they're not digging the foundation of obedience to God's word. And the flood will hit, and their spiritual house will come crashing down. And the third thing, this guy didn't bother to put in a foundation because he was short-sighted. He was living for the here and now without the thought of the future. He was, it, it wasn't raining when he threw up his house. The riverbed was dry. Flood? What flood? A flood was not in his sinking. He just wanted to get inside his new house and enjoy the, the, enjoy the comforts it provided. And spiritually, we are fools if we do not live in light of death and the judgment to follow. And when the very day comes when your soul will be required of you, where will you be? If you profess to be a Christian, but... Living all these years for yourself, no regard for furthering God's kingdom, your life is built on sand. It will collapse when the flood of God's judgment hits. Unfortunately, I've seen this many times. Professing Christians engaged in ministry who are in it for themselves. What motivates them for Christian service is not for the glory of God. They're not doing it because they love the Lord. It's about satisfying their own selves. They love the affirmation. But if their service goes unrecognized or if someone else gets credit, they get angry and then they quit. Their motive is to please self not to please God. And what they do is they risk future judgment and they will miss out on hearing those precious words from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me conclude with this. What can we do to make sure that our house is built on the rock of obedience to Jesus, not on sand? First thing, and you can write this down if you need to, whatever. You must come to Jesus. This means a personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship between Jesus and you. You never want to hear Jesus say in Matthew 7, 23, I never knew you. Do you know Jesus? Does Jesus know you? You see, Christianity is not a system of rules where you, where you decided to start working on a list. It's a genuine personal relationship with the risen, living Savior. Your sins have separated you from Him, but His shed blood reconciles you to God. And the second thing is, you must hear Jesus' words. And this means growing in your knowledge and understanding of his teaching. And you're doing that here today. That's good. And if you're not feeding daily on God's word, 
learning how he wants you to live, then you're living according to the desires of the flesh. And you're being squeezed into the world's mold. And the Bible teaches two main points you have to know and live by. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And lastly, third, you must act upon his words. This means it's a soul-searching obedience down to the very thoughts and motives of attitudes of your heart. It means continually examining ourselves in light of Scripture. And when you read the Psalms that say, praise the Lord and sing for joy, you ask yourself, is my mind filled with praise to God and joy in Him, or am I always complaining? You apply scripture to your life, and the bottom line of, of our time is, is words should be, how then should I live? The forecast is that there's a 100% chance of a flood hitting your life in the near future. In light of that forecast, now is the time to check your foundation. If you're living in daily obedience to Jesus, on the heart level, your home will stand. And if you call him Lord, but you are not li but living for yourself, you better start digging. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. You know, Jesus, these teachings are really, really hard. Because they get to the core of our heart. And, and, and it causes us, Lord, to look at, at inside and we hate what we really see. But thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you give us the courage to look deep inside and say, you know what, I, I'm really tired of this. I don't want to be fake. I want to be legit. And it's what's so cool, Lord. You, you just don't send us off on our own and say, well, we'll figure it out. Figure out how to be one-on-one -on -one with me. No. You're like, let me grab your hand. Let me put my arms around you. And let's do this together. That's a beautiful thing. Thank you for this teaching, Lord, on this foundation or lack of we want a strong foundation because it's a win, win, win. Not just for us, but those who are close to us will also benefit because our foundation is strong in Jesus Christ. Amen. There were two men, each set out to build their home. One built his upon the rocks, while the other did so upon the sand. And then came the storm. There are absolutes. Things that are fixed that no matter how much we may want to move them, will always remain. Jesus said anyone who hears his words and does them will have his life built upon the rock. But to not do them is to live upon the sand. Rock or sand. You see, the ocean is immense, completely vast, pulled by forces beyond man's control, and therefore, it demands respect. You see, it doesn't know you and it doesn't care about you. It can't. The ocean is an unyielding force. You've been to it. And much like the tides of the ocean, each wave of our culture is a voice washing over the known ideas and fixed points of the world around us. This energy, this force, presses on as each new generation takes the place of the last. And the sands that we've come to identify with shift. The waves move the sand. 
culture changes, we're told that there is no God and you are an accident. There's no right or wrong way. You make your own truth. On these sands, even established scientific facts like gender are shifting. From here, fame and popularity become more important than kindness and virtue. The lines of good and evil are blurred. Compliance to these ideas is demanded, and the rock? The rock is hated. You see, culture will mold you, and society will shape you. It will forcibly bend you to its will as long as you remain on the shore. And today, we haven't just built homes on the sand. No, we've built kingdoms and countries upon it. More and more have left the rock to enjoy the temporary pleasures of the shore, unaware that nothing will withstand the tide. Make no mistake, the tide is rising. These sands will move. Don't let yourself be drawn out to sea, but rather find the rock. Without a foundation, without a guide, and without rules, we know a society breaks down. See, we've been taught to look at the teachings of Jesus as something to block us from pleasure and enjoyment, when in reality, it was put there to build our life upon to protect us. The world always calls to us, but it never wants us to leave. And yes, I fully engage society, but my home is on the rock. The water is already rising. We're living in a world gone mad, and no one has the answers. When the floods come, something always has to give. Either the waves will break you, or the rock will break the waves. There's only one who can save us. He's the one who walked on water through the storm to save those who believed in him. When Peter began to sink under the waves, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus, with compassion in his eyes, pulls Peter from the water. He holds his hand to you. There's no condemnation. He's not mad. He just wants to save you, to pull you to the rock.
crown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way and what he says we will do and where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey trust Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and pray. I don't know, maybe you can see why if, if, if that was my last sermon, that would probably be a good one, wouldn't it? No, it's not. That video was powerful and so true. You know, the fact that you're here this morning and those who are on live stream watching, it shows that you want a firm foundation. Just keep digging. Keep showing up. And let's dig the foundation together because we become stronger. God bless you, everyone, and have a wonderful day, wonderful week. Amen.